What we're looking at here is TYT's newest radio that is just starting to reach into the North American market. It's their waterproof dual band, pretty much meant, I think, to eclipse the 8200D that has been a very popular seller for them for a number of years. The 8200D was not very good in terms of how waterproof the case was. For example, if you were to take apart in any tone, you'll find a silicone gasket surrounding the components inside uh, where it interfaces with the plastic case. The TYTs that uh, I've seen, the 8200D in particular, doesn't have such a thing, so it's not even as nearly as water resistant as those. That seems to have the problem solved with this model, the 8200, which is built in the same chassis, chassis and case as the MD390. Uses the same battery packs and it's pretty much the same case. Uh, the display is a little different, the fonts are different, and um, the rest, pretty much the buttons over here on the side are the same, and this plug on this side where you plug in your mic and your programming cables is the same. And it does work with the standard prolific chipsets as well as FDDI and Silicone Labs chipsets uh, that all the standard Chinese radios are programmed with, which is unlike the MD390, which does not use the TTL USB serial adapter style chips. So what we'll do is look at some of the pros and cons of this radio in my mind. I don't like reviews that are not as objective as possible, so I will try not to stray too far off and be as objective as I can and not try to address things I don't know about. So if something's lacking, my apologies, I would rather just not cover it than make something up so that I could impress you with my degree of erudition, which I definitely don't have much of. So we'll have a quick look here at the brochure that they've got out so far. The manual is not in print yet. They do have an electronic copy of it. And um, pretty much here is what you'll see, uh, what you're expecting. They are hoping to get a GPS integration into this, which is not available uh, this time. And this review is doing, being done on March the 12th, 2017. So we'll see <coughs> where they get from there. Uh, the GPS, it'd be interesting. I don't know what they're going to do with the terms of the GPS. Uh, I see there's a man down feature, and that would be really handy for tree well rescue or uh, other sorts of things in the field. But with the MD390, you query one of the other radios to get the GPS coordinates from it, and you've got to be on a digital channel. These are not digital radios, so I'm not too hopeful as to what you're going to be able to achieve with the GPS that's going to be built into it, other than perhaps to find out where on the planet you're standing at any given time, which Nowadays, you're going to do with your phone, your inReach, your spot, or maybe your Garmin. So 256 channels, though, is an improvement over the 8200's 128 channels. And we'll see here in the programming in a minute that those 256 channels do indeed exist. And um, it is wide, narrow band, selectable, and so on and so on. Um, the antennas... Again, if you watch our other videos regarding standing wave and forward and reflected power on these antennas, I would say your best bet is throw the antennas in the garbage when you get your radio. Um, that's your best bet. We've had very, very poor luck with the TYT antennas. Um, worse than probably some of the other brands. All the Chinese antennas are pretty much universally garbage. So um, if you think you're going to use one in the field and get away with it, 
go right ahead. If you don't mind wrecking your radio and you want to be buying a new radio in a year or two because of all the damage you've done with a standing wave that has a ratio of about 13 if you're up around 165, um, that's what you call living dangerously. So, RF power here, uh, like the 8200, it's a 5 on high and or five on low sorry and 10 watts on high and uh, no other big surprises there pretty much what you would expect the color display is the nice feature the waterproof part is the nice feature and uh, I think in my mind it's a nice improvement over the 8200D now we're just going to move on before we actually get in with a hands-on part of the review uh, we're going to take a look at the programming software which again is no surprise coming from the uh, part of uh, Asia that the rest comes from. As usual, you cannot import. So this is it over on the left, by the way. And on the right, I've got the RT Systems uh, proprietary software with uh, an a the 8000D uh, file. Sorry, I think previously I kept referring to the 8000D as the 8200D my apologies for the confusion I meant 8000D. Uh, on the right here is some files from an 8000D uh, file that uh, is in the RT systems proprietary software so you'll see with this software for example you can uh, import or export which is pretty much what you want to see with this sort of thing. With the first version and probably all forthcoming versions of the TYT software no such luck you there's what you get you can open an existing file create a new one and save and so on even printing you don't get a lot of options uh, and then all, all this does is allow you to uh, go in and edit some of these areas that are over here on the left it's it's not all that great and so what you have to do if you're upgrading from another radio of any sort this is what you're faced with you're gonna have to bring up your radio your old radio on the right and then manually duplicate every channel channel by channel until you get to the end and to make it even worse over here let's say on the right if I wanted to copy that cell and move it over to this cell you can't see my hand right now but I am right clicking my mouse and I am not getting any sort of drop down so so much for copy paste using the mouse however we do have the option of control C for copy and control V for paste so I'm going to hit control V now and see what happens and um, well actually even if it was pasting it would look the same but it doesn't so control V control C does not work and uh, so all you can do is manually type each single cell in and ironically to even more frustrating let's say you get over here to your TX frequency and you would like to move down and again you won't be able to see me but I am now pressing my down arrow key nothing hit the enter key that's what happens with enter it toggles between that but it doesn't go anywhere and so the only way to move to the next cell is to do so with your mouse type that and then actually when you're finished typing that in you can move to the right with your right arrow key so you can toggle back and forth between those two cells with the arrow keys that's the only thing oh I just moved up with the arrow key I didn't even know that until just now try that again how about that and now ironically you cannot move down with the down arrow key but you can move up with the up arrow key so you can move up and you can move sideways and uh, there you can move and you can move unlimited sideways back and forth and I guess yep you can move up but you can't move down so um, just be prepared for a couple hours if you're going to be moving over and uh, there's no scroll bar on the right so if you want to get down through the software you can use I'm using the 
roller button on my mouse right now and you can see here that you do get down to the end of about 256. So that's what you're looking at from the standpoint of programming the radio. And uh, that pretty much covers that for what I'm going to be looking at there. So now I think the best thing to do would be go over to the bench and maybe we can <laughs> we don't need to test the ra uh, batteries I've already done battery pack discharge tests for the MD390 it's the same battery pack the capacity the real capacity works out to be 1900 milliamps not 22 as claimed uh, but you do still get a decent lifespan at least I do with the MD390 I left it on a picnic table with the display actually backlight turned on constantly and it went for uh, probably about 24, 22 hours, somewhere in that area. So that is uh, pretty much what I want from a radio, and uh, I'm okay with that. And um, we'll move now over to, sorry, I don't know why that uh, TYT3000A just came up. Um, but anyway, by the way, the 3000A just deployed 15 of them in the field to a client that's on a one hectare site with uh, buildings with cement and then woods. And even people outside the building found uh, their their frequency is 166. And they found that with this stock antenna on there, they couldn't even talk to staff that were outside the building very well. When we then gave them, uh, so that we were waiting for some stubbies to arrive from Smiley for the radios, I said, well, I'm going to send you five of the 5 8 wave smileys just to stick on these radios so we can see if the radios are, are at fault or if the antennas are an issue. As soon as they put the proper tune smileys of 165 on these units, they perform wonder wonderfully, not only with from with anywhere in their one hectare site, in the woods down over terrain features but all the way to the other side of Banff they were still communicating with each other on 5 watts so again this just goes back to speaking about these antennas no matter which one you're getting plan on buying aftermarket antennas for that so with that we're going to move over to the bench now and proceed on with uh, yet another long and uh, boring video. Well as you can see the weather isn't the greatest. It's April 9th here in Banff and uh, we got a pretty good snowstorm which is why I love the mountains. And uh, I have the 8200 for a frequency test that I'm going to do with a friend who is presently driving away from me and increasing the distance and we're going to touch base and see how far that uh, Mark can get away and we're going to be transmitting around the 170 mark so I have the yellow antenna on here which is tuned for, center tuned for 170. Given the weather uh, I'm using some of our speaker mic covers even though this is a water resistant mic and uh, as you know the radio is rated for this but because I have the speaker mic plugged in that decreases its water resistant capability if you're out and it's pouring rain you should probably just have a plug on there unless you've got the radio protected inside your clothing. So I'm going to uh, let Mark get into place and then we'll see how we make out with our distance which you'll see plotted on the Google Earth map here right now and uh, this is what we're looking at for what our distances are with a little bit of terrain features in between us. We don't have any ridges, we just have a lot of forest cover that's probably going to be between us for line of sight. So here we have an overview of the two locations and the separation between the two radios which is 12 miles or 19 kilometers approximately. You'll see here that we are near the Healy Pits in Banff and the terrain features that are between is mainly forest and um, a few smaller hills 
there we have a valley and we have some ridges coming down eventually ending up over here at Mark's location at Moose Meadows. So that's what we're going to be looking at for our distance and that takes place in the heavy snowfall and you can see here pretty much it's a valley bottom chute with some ridges coming down into the valley. Okay, Mark just called me and said he's in place at Moose Meadows, which you'll see on the map there. And we're going to do a couple of tests here and see. Mark from John. Mark, how do you copy? Copy better from here. Yep. Roger, that's much better. What did you do? No, uh, I've lost you again, Mark. So whatever you did there last time, that was working, but now it went back to uh, being just a more of a static than anything. <clears throat> okay, uh, and another thing that uh, if you look at what's at your feet, um, because the way your grounding does affect it, so whether the difference between standing in a pool of water or standing in dry pavement, that can change things as well. So right now I'm standing on pavement. Okay, let's try that. That looks a little better. Yeah, the snow even seems like a little bit better. So, uh, why don't you go ahead and give me a backward count from uh, countdown from ten? Mark, uh, you were pretty broken up until you got to two and then one so if there's possible to review if anything changed uh, at the end there then that's what we would try and do again I will try it one more time yeah I'm copying you uh, three by four now so go ahead Yeah, if you can lean over your hood and place the radio vertically right over about the center point of the hood, uh, as close to the hood as possible, I'd like to see if that changes anything. There we go. I've got the radio over the hood of the truck right now. Perfect. Uh, you're almost 5 by 5 Maybe you can give me a countdown again. Yeah, Mark, that was perfect. Um, just something you saw that's probably worthy of note there was the differences between just the location of where the radio was and the effects of ground plane upon your signal. And most of you are probably more aware and more experienced and could explain it better than I could. 
but basically what we were seeing there was when you had a better ground plane you had a better signal so the rubber duck um, is radiating the signal think of it as being the core of a butterfly and the signal being butterfly wings propagating off in like flux lines so when you transmit it uses a reference of a virtual ground plane or a real ground plane depending on the circumstances and porous surfaces such as snow are very poor ground planes or porous regolithic materials or detritus and things like that so we saw with Mark when he moved around uh, he was on pavement and it was wet and he was changing some of the propagation characteristics of his ground plane that affected his signal but what it did the best was when he used the metal from the hood of his vehicle and it was the same in my case where I used uh, the middle of the roof by standing on my door and perching this on the roof of the vehicle that was when the signal was best we had the ground plane of the metal surface of the vehicle and that's why for example uh, a 5 8 wave antenna does have better propagation characteristics than a half wave a half wave is ground plane independent but when you do have a ground plane you will get better propagation and that's why you're better off to go with the 5 8 when you can on your vehicle or um, even one that emulates a 5 8 propagation through the way they build it such as Smiley with this 5 8 search and rescue. So those are just some final thoughts on that and I'm sure that uh, you can improve on my thoughts by putting some of your comments below. So just before wrapping things up we're going to do a power test on this radio and we'll look at uh, forward power I believe this is probably on high setting right now and we'll start with looking at what our standing ratio, standing wave ratio is going to be for this test. So 1.4, 1.3, 1.4 at 165 and we are using the tuned uh, antenna there as you can see our yellow which uh, is 165 to 175 range that's the IPX6. Now we'll move up to forward power and see what we're getting on that frequency. And we're looking at 9.6, 9.7 for our forward power reading. And uh, now we'll look at what we're getting reflected back. 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So that uh, math takes us to about the 10 watts that this radio claims to have for the high power setting. And it might be interesting just to compare while we've got all this set up, what we would be getting if we were to try and use the stock antenna on this radio. So we're going to quickly do that. So I've placed the stock antenna on the radio and uh, this antenna reads on the base 136 to 174 megahertz. Uh, you probably can't see that but that's how it comes. So we'll start with the standing wave on the stock antenna and we see here almost 12. We will, and once again, uh, you preferably wouldn't want to go much over three maximum of four on your standing wave and uh, as a result of having that high standing wave that's probably reflecting a lot of power back into the radio let's see uh, what we have for forward power we're showing seven watts of forward power and let's see how much is being reflected out of that seven watts back we're getting 4.8 so by using the stock antenna on high power you're effectively getting a 2 watt radio very similar to an FRS radio losing about uh, 80 percent 75 to 80 percent of your maximum power output by using the stock antenna the conclusion is you do not want to be using the stock antenna at frequencies this frequency as you saw was 165 megahertz um, I can tell you from experience you would not want to go up much above 155 and um, why not maybe we'll have a look at that while we've got all this set up 
So here we've got the radio in VFO mode and I punched in 155 on the upper A band and I've got the standing wave ratio measurement set up on the top SWR meter and when I hit the push to talk we're getting a standing wave of 7.2 or 7 uh, which is double what we really want to see so let's try 150 and see if that improves things. At 150, our standing wave is 5.5. It does get improved. And uh, last, we'll go to 145 and see what happens to the standing wave, 2.7. So what they've done is they've provided a stock antenna that is suitable for amateur radio band frequencies. And no commercial frequency really should be used with the stock antenna that's provided with the radio we will pull out the long one now and see if there's any improvement on that one just for uh, s and giggles if you get a long antenna that comes with the radio uh, it's a dual band and uh, it has the frequency stamped on the bottom for the two dual band frequencies 136 to 174 i don't know 400 to 470 something like that on the bottom and uh, with that one on 145 we get a standing wave of 4.5 which is not really all that great and let's try 155 and see what that results in with the standing wave 6.2 I'm not gonna carry on and bother doing um, I lied let's go with forward power on 155 with that long antenna 6.8 and let's see what's reflected back 3.6 so now you've got uh, a little over 3 watts it improved things a little bit but it's nothing you'd want to write home to your mother about again if you're going commercial frequencies you're going to need to go with tuned antennas this isn't a shill to promote our antennas do whatever commercial tuned antenna that you want but do use a tuned antenna that is suitable for the frequency you're on if you're doing anything outside of the amateur band frequencies.